So, hello everyone. Uh, I was so I, I was asked to do this session a couple of years ago, and uh, I was asked to do this kind of session a couple of times, a couple of years ago, and unfortunately, the I don't think the people who asked me to do that session are here in this connect. But yeah, such is life. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have uh, a brief look of what goes in GCC. It's it's a very like high level overview of how GCC is laid out under the hood. Uh, it it is good enough for uh, someone to actually start looking at GCC internals and hopefully even hacking on GCC. So what we're going to do in the next like uh, it says R, but probably around 45 minutes is that we look at uh, we'll start by looking at how your uh, program goes from your source code to the final form, which is the binary code, uh, the binary executable, uh, which will uh, which will basically involve walking through various outputs of, of GCC, the assembler, linker, and so on. And once we've gone through that, we'll start digging a little deeper into GCC. So we'll we'll look at the major structures, uh, the the major data structures that make up. Uh, and, and the ma major functionality that makes up uh, the compiler, right? And finally, I'll uh, I'll suggest like a couple of ways that you can uh, start getting involved in GCC. Well, not the development upstream, but at least uh, getting yourself familiar with the source code uh, by making some small changes in the compiler or uh, using compiler flags to understand what the compiler is doing under the hood. So I'm a toolchain tech lead for Linaro Developer Services. Uh, we provide professional services uh, in the ARM ecosystem. I also uh, do a lot of contribution in the GNU toolchain ecosystem. I'm a maintainer of the GNU C library and also have commits in GCC and binutils. And nowadays I'm hacking on uh, Lua JIT, which is, I'll probably talk about it next year. Right, so uh, to begin with, uh, from source to binary. So this is something that uh, I guess uh, most of the people in this audience will be familiar with, right? This is what a compiler does, a compiler tool chain. Uh, it'll read program code. Uh, it'll try to optimize the logic to try and uh, uh, do as less operations as possible. Uh, it'll generate assembly code. That assembly code then... Uh, is built into binary object code, which is then linked into the final binary. So what does GCC look like uh, in, in this scheme, the GNU toolchain? So this is what the GNU toolchain looks like. You have, you have source code, uh, which goes into GCC, which then goes into the GNU assembler, and then uh, to the linker. And in that, GCC only does three things, which is reading the program code, optimizing it, and generating assembly. And then it will call the assembler, which takes the assembly code, and it will assemble it into binary object code. And then it calls the linker, which takes that binary object code, because the binary object code cannot do anything by itself. And it will essentially build a house around it to, to give you your final uh, executable. So very quickly, we'll go into demo mode. So I have my, well, too soon for this one. Right. So this is my Hello World program, right? Uh, this is probably something that you must have written uh, way back uh, in your college days. So what we're going to do is, uh, so typically, this is how you would build your program. So this is the command you would use to build your program, right? Uh, of course, in college, you'd probably be even more lazy. You won't say minus O, hello, hello world. You just, you know, A dot out is good enough for everyone, isn't it? So <laughs> even now, I know, after so many years. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so this is how you build your program, and this is how you run your program, and, and you have your output. Right? But then there are three different things that your 
uh, your GCC command ends up doing. And the first thing that it does is it generates assembly, right? So the way you would do that with GCC is this. You give the minus S flag. So that tells uh, the compiler, the compiler driver, that it is uh, supposed to only generate assembly and quit at that. Now once you do this, you get assembly code. Typing with one hand is difficult. Uh, yes, there you go. Right? So this is, this is the assembly code that you get in the end, which is, this was your main function. There you go. Right? And, and a lot of craft, which is assembly directives above and below it, something that the assembler will understand and generate code accordingly. So now if you look at this, we called printf, and GCC did this, right? So how did it, how did it do puts instead of printf? That's, that's an optimization. That's a very simple optimization that you can see right off the bat. And uh, it does that because printf without any arguments is... Uh, it, it, you're better off calling puts because puts is very fast in comparison, right? So you got assembly. Now the next thing you do is you assemble this source code, right? And you assemble it into object code. Dot o. There. So this will only result in assembling of this code. Oh, wait, let me do something else. Let me just call the assembler directly. Right? I'm not going to do this with the linker because it's, it's, it's a lot harder with the linker. So I get object code and I use obj dump disassemble hello world dot o, right? So now when I do this, this is the, this is the function as, it, uh, as the assembler assembled it, which is very simple, right? It's, it's, it's the main function. Uh, it calls a certain function that we know, don't know about yet because we have only assembled the program. We have not actually linked it with any external library, right? And that is something that the linker will do. So to actually give some sort of meaning to this program, the linker will have to be called. What the linker will do is it will fill in that slot, right? It will it'll figure out what it needs to call. And also it will build the, the proverbial house around this binary, which is uh, it, will, it will call the real function that gets uh, called on startup. So how many of you think that main is the first function that ca gets called in the program? There is no shame in thinking that way, right? But then the real function that gets called is this function called underscore start, right? And then there are constructors that call, get called even before that by the dynamic linker, and there's like a whole kind of uh, set of things that happen around it. And those things are uh, in this fourth project that I have not mentioned so far because nobody loves that project, which is GLIPC, right? So GLIPC has uh, all of these uh, stubs that, that kind of help you build your uh, final binary. So how do you see, uh, how do you uh, link this uh, into a final program? So I'm going to use GCC, and you'll see why, because uh, there are way too many flags that I'll have to specify if I invoke the linker directly. I'm going to say minus V, that is verbose mode, so that you see exactly what the linker uh, uh, flags are when it is being called. Minus O, hello world. Um, hello world dot O. All right? There. Okay, I... I need to zoom out for this. I never thought that will happen. There you go. 
All right. So uh, your it's much harder to read on the project. There it is. This is your linker command. So the collect to program is essentially a driver to call the linker. And all of these flags are, well, you don't need all of them, but the, the key ones that you would need are the, the CRT object files. Those are provided by glibc. CRT begins, CRTN, CRTN, uh, CRT1. So all of these contain uh, the constructors, destructors, uh, the underscore start, underscore finny, and so on. So th those are the object files. And then you also need the standard C library. Can anyone spot minus LC? Yeah, there it is, right? So you're, you're linking against libc.so. And without that, you're not going to get anything, right? If you're, if you're linking statically, uh, your, your libc code, whatever you need, like puts in this case, will get built into the program. Otherwise, you just get a, a, a PLT stub that calls into the dynamic library, right? So now we know how this entire workflow works for the GNU toolchain, right? Any questions so far? <laughs> okay. I have no idea. Where's Richard when you need him? <laughs> See run time? Okay, that, there you go. I'm too young for that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, uh, any other question? You had the same question, was it? Okay, all right. Any other question before I move on? Not a question, but uh, there's an option to use minus minus save temps. Save temps. Right, okay. Okay, I'm going to show you an even cooler flag at the end of it, right? It'll show you all of the intermediate code, right? So that, that, that is going to be even more fun. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to move on to GCC now. So we're, we're going to only look at this box above. We're not going to look at the assembler and linker because we'll probably need four hours to do everything. And uh, honestly, I don't know all of that in, in like one go. Right, so this is what a compiler would look like. This is, uh, this is a generic compiler. This is what uh, it would do. It would read program code, it'll optimize program logic, and it'll generate assembly code. So the, the part that reads the source code is uh, called the uh, compiler front end. And uh, typically, like in, in a, uh, well, in LLVM, I think you'll, you'll have something like three front ends, I think C, C++, maybe Object C, and uh, then there's a Fortran front end. In GCC, there's probably about a dozen or so uh, front ends as well. Then you have the middle end, which does all of the optimization, all of the fun stuff. And uh, the optimizations don't happen on the front end uh, language because you, you, if you have so many front ends, you need some common representation that uh, that that can give you what you want in in the front end program, and that representation is called an intermediate representation. So you have a few hundred optimization passes that will iterate over the source code, uh, the, the intermediate code, again and again, to try and come up with the most optimal form of the program. And then finally you have uh, the set of passes that generate assembly code, which is the compiler backend, where you take that intermediate rep representation, lower it further, and generate the machine code that, that would uh, be then assembled by the assembler and so on and so forth. So what does it... It's called an intermediate representation. Uh, for GCC, there's, there's like two or three different kinds of intermediate representations, which is what I'm getting to now. So this is your, wait, yep. So this is what a GCC looks like, right? So you have a bunch of uh, uh, front-end programming languages, which is your C family. C family is, uh, I think, C and Objective-C, and uh, 
if I remember correctly, it's also a subset of C++, which it, it, it uh, is common with C. And then you have CP, which is the C++. And then there's Fortran, and I believe there's D language, and uh, a lot of others. Uh, there's a GCJ front end as well, which is the Java uh, compiler. So those are all your front ends. And uh, that's, that's where you'll find the source code. So you, you, you can actually see the lexer. You can see the parser in action over there. Uh, the C parser, for example, is handwritten in C. Uh, and it's not like flex or it used to be bison at some point, I think. Uh, but now it's handwritten. Uh, once, once you, you once the, uh, once GCC actually passes the, uh, program, it will generate, uh, its intermediate representation. So there are three representations. Uh, there's generic GIMPL and RTL. I've not mentioned generic here, but I'll talk about generic later. Uh, but then GIMPL and RTL are really, uh, the workhorses as far as, optimization and code generation is concerned for uh, GCC. Uh, GIMPL is uh, the uh, machine independent uh, representation and RTL is much lower down and it, it's much closer tied to uh, a typical machine. So your optimization passes are in, in the GCC tree itself, right? And all of the middle end optimizations, meaning optimizations that do not need direct information of the hardware, terms and conditions applied. Uh, they are all tree uh, optimization passes, and they're all tree hyphen, uh, so on, like tree SSA loop, tree SSA, I think there's tree IV, and so on and so forth. And there's a terms and conditions applied over there, uh, which I'll come to uh, near the end of the uh, talk. And then finally, you have uh, code that deals with the backend, and the backend is in the config directory, and each architecture has a subdirectory inside that uh, config directory. And there's a bunch of files in there that control uh, how your uh, middle-end code uh, eventually gets to the machine code. Right, so this, this basically expands on, on exactly the same idea. Okay, so digging deeper. Uh, so IRs are pretty much the backbone of uh, any compiler. Uh, so with LLVM, you have LLVM IR. Uh, with GCC, you have three different forms. Uh, I believe there's something more in LLVM, which I'm not aware of, because I'm, I've not looked at LLVM that much. Uh, so generic is pretty much the first thing that uh, a parser generates, right? So it is a tree structure uh, that, that the parser generates, and uh, it, it acts as an interface between the parser and the optimizer. Uh, the tree structure, that is the generic structure, then gets lowered into GIMPL, which is a, a lot more restrictive. It, it doesn't have any uh, branch constructs or loop constructs. It has go-tos, though. Uh, and it is uh, a very uh, primitive three-operand uh, uh, tuple kind of uh, structure, and it's sequential. Uh, there is something called as a control flow graph which connects all of those things together. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then finally, you have RTL, which is a lot closer to the machine. So you, you have GIMPL. You do optimizations on GIMPL, and then you lower it down further into RTL, and then you do optimizations on RTL and finally generate the machine code. So generic, like I said, it's, it's, it's a tree structure. It is, uh, all of its nodes are, are essentially tree nodes uh, that are connected to each other. Uh, as such, I think there's, there's probably one pass that uses generic directly. Otherwise, uh, the, the best use of generic, I think, is, uh, is in the form of the tree nodes that get passed in as operands to GIMPL. Right? And those operands would typically be of this type, which is uh, you, you have a... Uh, a parent structure, as it were, to indicate what type of a tree it is. And then you would have actual data. Like for a tree string, you would have the length of the string and the uh, string itself, which is uh, a character array. So GIMPL is really the optimizer workhorse. Uh, GIMPL is what uh, the, the middle-end optimizer 
works on throughout uh, all of the optimization passes. And uh, they're basically linear statements uh, that have no more than three operands. Of course, if it's a call, uh, if it's a fu function call, then it would have more than three operands, but it typically has uh, like a destination and s multiple sources. Uh, the tuple types are uh, defined in gimpl.def. Uh, in fact, uh, gimpl RTL tree, uh, all of the types, uh, there is a .def file which gets uh, included and, and you, you, you can get all of the types uh, from that uh, def uh, uh, file. And then like I said, there's a control flow graph which uh, defines the control flow in uh, uh, for Gimpl. So Gimpl by itself does not uh, have a lot of control flow inf information. Uh, it is the control flow graph that provides that. So control flow graphs essentially layer on on top of Gimple and RTL. Uh, there is there are basic blocks that are connected to each other with edges, and a basic block would uh, be a sequence of Gimple statements, right? And when you have, like I said, uh, the only control information you would have in Gimple is which uh, which basic block you're jumping to. So you can go from one basic block to another. So you'll have a go to Gimpel go to statement which uh, specifies which basic block uh, you're going to. So the CFG dot star, um, the CFG dot C and CFG dot H uh, actually describe how uh, you would manipulate the control flow graph, and you'd want to do that, uh, but only through uh, the Gimpel and RTL uh, hooks, and not directly, uh, because it needs to be consistent at every uh, point of the uh, compilation process. Loops get specialty treatment. So y there is there is a first class loop structure which uh, in, in the control flow graph which allows you to identify loops within your program. And uh, that is very important because a bulk of the optimization passes work on loops. So the other uh, important concept in Gimple is uh, single static assi assignment. Uh, SSA forms are uh, very common. Uh, compilers like LLVM and GCC employ them. Even uh, tiny JITs like LuaJIT also uh, employ the SSA form. Uh, what SSA does is it simplifies your uh, code by making sure that any variable that you have is assigned to only once. So that makes uh, data flow analysis a lot easier. So I've, I've given a, s a sample uh, transformation over here for SSA form. So if you have x equals 10 and then x plus equals 20, the, the, the SSA form for that would be you, you make a copy of uh, or a version of uh, a variable x, which is x1, which becomes 10. And then you make, make a new version, x2, uh, which is x1 plus uh, 20. Then you have these mysterious entities called phi nodes or phi nodes. I don't know how they're uh, pronounced. Uh, they are used for uh, making uh, versions of, of uh, SSA versions of uh, variables that that are that have a conditional value. Like for example, in this case, if n is greater than 10, then x is 10 or x is 20. So you you have two versions, x1 and x2, which may be 10 or 20, and the return value is going to be a, a phi of x1 or x2, which is x3. OK, so now we have, we have finished middle end comp compilation, and now we move on to RTL. So RTL is, again, it, it's lowered from Gimple, and it is an even uh, more uh, rudimentary uh, representation in the sense that it is intended to be as close to machine language as possible. Right? So it has two ways in which it can be uh, described in GCC. It can either be described as a structure, which is an RTX structure, it's called, or it can be uh, described in a Lisp-like uh, language in S expressions. And uh, you see these S expressions a lot in something called as a machine description in uh, GCC. And machine description is where uh, if you're a hardware vendor or if you're, if you're looking to optimize your, uh, your compiler output for a specific CPU, that's where all the fun is. 
Okay. Right. So we want, uh, in the end of the entire uh, compilation process, we want assembly, right? We want assembly code to be output. And what a machine description does is it describes your RTL uh, in S expression form, which will tell you for what kind of pattern of uh, uh, operation, what kind of, uh, what, what machine instructions you want to emit, right? So it could be a straight one is to one kind of uh, emission where if you have an addition of two half integers, then you just uh, emit the add instruction. Or it could be something that is a little more complex depending on what the machine supports, uh, the underlying machine. So uh, there's a GCC pre-processing tool which, which parses these S expressions and actually generates these structures. Uh, but then it's, it's something that allows uh, GCC developers to conveniently you know, write a, a whole set of very basic rudimentary instructions, and then you can use uh, something like define expands to, to do more complex conversions of uh, those expressions into a set of uh, instructions. So every architecture has one uh, machine description. Uh, again, terms and conditions apply over here. Uh, there, there are caveats, which I'll talk about in a while. Right, so uh, like I said, uh, typically you'd see a lot of uh, these RTL expressions that, that uh, show you exactly what uh, instruction is being emitted. Uh, but then there may be cases where uh, you want to make more intelligent decisions about what code you want to generate. Uh, for example, uh, you want to look at neighboring instructions and try to uh, combine them into specific, like longer instructions like load pairs, store pairs, and so on. So that you can do with these uh, define expand uh, uh, types, and all of those, uh, a bunch of those are uh, are in, in in C sources inside the config directory for that architecture. So that was uh, that was all the data structures that are uh, involved and, and the major files that are involved in in uh, uh, parsing and and optimizing your source code. So the the stuff that actually does that is the optimization pass, and there are a few hundred optimization passes, and uh, in general there are two classes of optimization passes, as it were. Uh, there are optimizers that uh, work on gen uh, on Gimple. Uh, which would be largely target independent, uh, meaning it most of the times it does not need information about what hardware it is running on, other than some rudimentary information like what is the size of vector and so on and so forth. Word sizes, for example. Uh, RTL op optimizers are more tied to the machine, so they will need a lot more information about the machine and uh, things like uh, what kind of registers are available, sizes of registers, numbers, and uh, then instruction scheduling related information like pipelines and so on and so forth. It, it needs all of that information about the back end to be able to generate the right uh, code for that machine. And then you can plug in your own optimization, uh, optimizer in uh, passes.def. I'll, I'll, I'll quickly show passes.def to you so that you have an idea of what it looks like. So you can see that there's, there's this whole uh, list of passes that, uh, well, next pass is a macro, basically. And uh, it, what, what, the, uh, what the compiler would do is it will run through all of these passes one by one. And each pass has uh, this gate condition. And I think it's a gate function. I don't remember exactly what it is. Uh, based on that, it will either run the pass or not run it. So if you want to plug in your pass, you can do it here, but then uh, that is not the best way to do it because typically you'd be, you'd be testing something for your architecture. Uh, and, and in that case, what is recommended is that you use the passes.def in your config directory.
right? So this has this really uh, neat feature where you can insert your pass before or after a specific pass. So it will it will actually hook your pass in between wherever you want it. So you can do really cool things like try to experiment with uh, putting your pass in different stages of the comp compilation and try to figure out what is the best place for your uh, optimization pass to be so that it uh, generates the best code for whatever target that you're you're testing out. Okay. So, am I running too fast or? Yeah, we have time. Uh, all right. So now we there's uh, everyone has a basic idea of how GCC is laid out and and. Uh, how various components in, interact with each other. Now, if you want to explore further, because again, this is very heavy, and it took me a very, very long time to make these slides. I, I cannot Im imagine that everyone remembers all of this in the last 30 minutes, right? So if you want to explore this, the way to do it, and this is way, the way I started exploring GCC under the hood, is using these two flags. F dump tree, well, it's one flag, F dump. Uh, you can dump either tree, output or RTL output. And this is the magic flag that I was talking about. Uh, what it does is it uh, it emits uh, your IR code at every single pass, right? And then you get to choose passes to see what transformations happened from one pass to another. And for the Hello World program that I'm about to show, the, the transitions are not very interesting. But you ha if you have some uh, interesting programs which have loops or something like that, uh, you, you can actually see things like the vectorizer and unroller and so on in action, and that is really, really cool. Okay, so I'll, I'll quickly show the tree optimizer pass. So if I say f dump tree all, it'll dump the output for all of the passes. You can actually name specific passes as well if you're, if you're debugging and if you want to find out exactly what happens in a single pass and don't want to clutter your file system because when you do this, this is what happens, right? So you have, I don't know, a bunch of files. And this is at O0, right? Now if you're going to do this at O3, This is even more fun, right? So there are so many of these. So um, does that dump every pass regardless of whether or not it actually made a change to the tree or are those passes that have actually made a difference? Okay, there's no flag that's only the ones that made a change, is there? So so that's why you, you first dump everything or, or you, so it depends. Uh, in, in, in a case where you don't have any clue as to which pass is uh, which pass is your like culprit in terms of a bug, you dump everything and then start looking through each of them one by one. Or if you know an optimization level, then you, you know that it's a certain set of passes that may be the cul culprit, and then you read through all of those and then look at the one that changed. Yeah, or so Not really, no. <laughs> Hey, it's more fun by hand, isn't it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Can you pass that? In, in what case would you like to put your optimization before other optimizations? Don't you want all the optimizations to happen and then do yours? No, so uh, to give an example, uh, you have register allocation and register renaming, right? Uh, and if I want to make sure that the register renaming happens only after, like I have this one specific pattern of allocation that I want. And I want that to happen before the renaming. So I want it to come before renaming. So there are, there are cases like that where, where you might want to plug in before uh, a certain pass so that you end up undoing that 
uh, effect or limiting the effect of the later passes. So uh, an optimizer doesn't necessarily optimize all the time. Uh, there are cases where the optimizer does something that you don't want it to do. Okay, so let's quickly look at one of uh, the outputs. Yeah, so this is not very interesting in the sense that it, it looks like straight up C, but then you can actually see that there's a there's a basic block there, which is BB2. That's that's the basic block that you're referring to. And then your printf became built in puts, and then you return zero and so on. Right? Uh, so there's another flag related to F dump tree, which is F dump tree all raw, which gives you something more interesting. So now if you look at it, it gives you exactly what kind of Gimple statement is there, right? Again, for this example, it's not very interesting, but for a more convoluted example, you, you'll actually be able to look at this output and uh, understand what went into the pass because the pass will actually have that kind of Gimple uh, manipulation that you can correlate with this output. So the RTL output is a little more hairy because they're all uh, Lisp S expressions, and if you're not used to reading Lisp, it's uh, it can be depressing. I've, I've been told. Yeah, so this is a lot of fun, isn't it? <laughs> so there's data flow summary, and then there is, okay, so this is one instruction, right? Let me see what it is. So it is a set, the target is some memory, uh, well, which is a stack pointer, and so on. Like there's, there's, a, there's another register here, which I can read right now. So, uh, Again, this would this would translate into whatever RTL descriptions you have, the RT, RTX structures you have. So when you're debugging, this this again becomes very useful to correlate with uh, whatever code that you're trying to debug. Right. So uh, these, the professor who taught me this, uh, I think about ten years ago, called this gray box testing. Right. And gray box testing is a great way to look at uh, the internals of whatever tool that you're using without actually tearing it apart and trying to, you know, uh, kind of pull out its guts and try to understand what is inside. So this is like controlled pulling out of guts if there's such a thing. Uh, and I, I found it very useful, and I'm sure a lot of you will find it very useful when you're trying to understand what the compiler is doing under the hoods. Okay, so now we come to the last part, which is uh, squeezing the last drop of performance from your machines. And this is where the terms and conditions applied bits come in. So I said, uh, for example, middle end uh, doesn't need to know anything about the machine. But there is something called as a cost table uh, that uh, intends to inform the middle end what the cost of doing various operations is. Uh, for a certain architecture, right? Or things like vector cost, uh, vector uh, sizes, the cost, cost of doing floating point, uh, what is the alignment that you need for functions, and so on and so forth. So all of those things come in uh, these cost tables. And those cost tables can be uh, specific to a microarchitecture. So it could be uh, all of ARM64, or it could be XGene1, it could be... Uh, a57, A72, and so on and so forth. And all of these have different characteristics. So you can tweak your passes 
your uh, uh, midland and uh, RTL passes by tweaking these cost tables. And uh, quite often, these are the best uh, kind of entry points into GCC because very quickly you can see uh, making small changes in there and and seeing code uh, generated that, that change like sometimes drastically uh, because of uh, small changes in uh, in values. The the other kinds of uh, changes that you would make uh, for microarchitectures are, are a little more extensive, in the sense that you you can describe a pipeline for a CPU, right? Like for example, if you have uh, a fifty three, which is an in order pipeline. Uh, I have no idea what is the issue rate for A53. Is it four instructions? Let's assume it is four instructions. And uh, so how many instructions can it take at a time? Uh, what are the pipes like? As in, it has one floating point, two integer, whatever it is. Is that, is that correct, James, or am I just fibbing? <laughs> one FP, two int? Shame on you. <laughs> no, that's fine. I, I, I just wanted to put you on the spot. Don't worry about it. <laughs> So you can you can actually describe uh, the CPU pipeline uh, to that detail, and GCC can actually understand that and generate uh, code a code schedule that runs best on uh, a Cortex A53 or A57, 72, whatever it is, right? So you can describe your your pipeline based on uh, whatever documentation you get from your uh, CPU vendor. You don't have to understand the middle end thoroughly to do these sort of changes. And in my experience, the middle end is probably the hairiest to uh, get into. Um, so I'll quickly show you the cost tables. Right, so this is essentially what these different cost uh, structures are. So you have uh, prefetch tuning, and uh, like you can see, this is prefetch tuning generic. Then this is for Exynos, not because Exynos is the coolest processor, it's just because, I don't know, somebody just put it there. Then there's QDF, there's Thunder X, and so on and so forth. So there's cache line sizes, then Prefetch tuning, I think uh, you put it in there, right, Maxwell? Yeah. And that was the, yeah, right. And then you have this big structure, which is all of the tunings together. So you have address cost, move uh, register move cost. So things like moving from register, uh, general purpose to general purpose register, or GP to FP, or FP back to GP. So different CPUs may have different costs for all of these things. And uh, actually allocating registers uh, using these hints is is uh, it, it it can make quite a difference. Right. So now this is the Cortex A5 A35 tuning. Ah, there's A53. Although, okay. Question. Is there a way on the command line of GCC to say, okay, look, I want to generate code that targets, you know, this this CPU, right? I mean, uh, oh, yeah, this yeah. specific, oh, wait, let me finish. This uh, specific uh, ARCH64 CPU, but I want GCC to optimize for, say, you know, a Thunder X2, right? So it would be, the, the generated code will be compatible for, let's say, any ARM V8, but it will be tailored for Thunder X2 because yes. we believe that we, we are going to run mostly the binaries on that architecture. Right, so there's, there's, a, there's an MCPU flag that does that exactly for you. Uh, and in fact, MCPU is what selects these structures. So you can even do funky things like uh, you're running on a Thunder X2, but for some reason you believe that your code is gonna run best if it is optimized for A57, for whatever random reason. You know, so you can, you can do those things as well. m -tune, sorry, yeah, m -tune. Okay, I, I am actually at the end of my presentation, so I'm open for questions. <laughs> so GCC compiles GCC, which compiles GCC, and then 
Uh, well, yeah. So uh, the way it works. <laughs> so uh, the way it works is if you're if you're building without Bootstrap, uh, your distribution compiler. Uh, in case of Linux, it'd be GCC. Uh, if it is something else, it could be some other compiler. So your distribution compiler will compile GCC first, and then that compiler will compile GCC again. Pretty much, yes. I don't know. What, what did RMS use to compile the first GCC? <laughs> Right. I mean, it could be Sun OS or whatever was prevalent at that time. So uh, that is the reason why it's called the bootstrap process, where where you uh, you use the compiler on your distribution to bootstrap GCC, which builds itself. How do you trust the compiler that's on your system? <laughs> okay. So there is. Uh, you were not at Cauldron, right? So we, we had this, uh, uh, I think it was reproducible builds. Uh, there was, there's, there's a project called reproducible builds. And uh, one aspect of that project is exactly this, where uh, you should be able to uh, bootstrap a compiler on any distribution and end up getting the same result. Which is yeah, it's it's kind of trippy, and it it, it attempts to uh, give the uh, uh, to answer the, uh, the the reflecting trust problem that you have. Uh, so yeah, there is a project. I don't think they're anywhere close to being being complete, but there is such a thing now. If, if you're interested uh, in that topic, I think Kernighan or Richie wrote a uh, paper wrote. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that's the reflection on trusting trust. That shows that's, that that's the paper there that is some knowledge about. inside the compiler, like what is a backslash n, for example, and right. you know only the compiler knows. Right. Yeah. That that is that is the paper that we were talking about, and uh, the reproducible builds project. Uh, well, it it tries to answer some simpler questions as well, but at its heart, it tries to answer this question. Where, how can we get to a point where we are trusting everything that we build with our compiler? That goes down to the CPU, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? LLVM differences from GCC, just high level. So, if if you uh, so here's I, how I would approach it, and this is because I've looked at LLVM only at like a really high level. I've I've looked at some of their uh, machine descriptions for like a small project that I had, right? And the way I would approach it is uh, the principle of front end, middle end, back end applies to every single compiler, right? Uh, so what I would try to do is I would try to differentiate these parts in that project. And in LLVM, I believe the, the back end is, uh, there, there's some templates. I think somebody was telling me that today, right? And uh, they're called table gen files. Table gen files, right, yeah. The mics are like all over the place. So yeah, they're called, they're called table gen files, uh, which would be your machine description in GCC, and then you'll have similar parallels uh, in passes as well. So it, it's a given that you're going to have a few hundred passes in a full, full-size compiler, and not tiny CC, right? Uh, in a full-size compiler, you'll have a few hundred passes. You'll have some mechanism to order them, so you can look for a file that orders those uh, passes. Then you would have front ends, so you would look for files that implement parsers. So that's that's the way I would look at it. Uh, at a higher design level, I doubt if there's a real difference because if you if you look at compiler technology in general, it doesn't move as fast as uh, I don't know cloud or because well uh, even cloud technologies at, at 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 the very base they're pretty much the same 
right? So you can transfer whatever knowledge you have about GCC into LLVM fairly easily in that sense. So when you compile GCC, is, is it depending on what version of glibc and things, libraries in the system? Okay, so there's usually a minimum version. I don't remember it off the top of my head. Uh, uh, okay, wait, you're, you're asking me to compile, to compile the GCC, what kind of glibc you need. Uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't depend on glibc per se. But it will, uh, so, like for example, to, for, for functioning, it will need glibc support. So when you're building a tool chain, per se, it will need uh, glibc. But to build itself, not really. So, so more than, more than performance, uh, I would say functionality. Like for example, thread local variables. Right? So for thread local variables, the constructor and destructors for thread local variables are implemented in glibc. So there is, there is that sort of interplay, and you need glibc for that. Can't you build a, a system-only GCC that can basically build bare metal programs that doesn't need a glibc to go yes, with Yes, you it? can, yeah. but you, you cannot do thread local variables and all of that. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. <laughs> so they're, they're all user space from right. types of things. Yes. Uh, this compilation of a single file, it's a single threaded operation or multiple threads work to generate object file, multiple passes? So uh, it's single threaded right now. In fact, there was a talk at GNU Tools Cauldron last week about, uh, I think there's a GSOC project about trying to make the uh, compilation process multi-threaded, uh, but then it's not ready yet, really. Isn't that going to really confuse Make when Make runs stuff in parallel and then GCC uses more <laughs> threads than, than Make thought you had? It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> so uh, on similar lines, there's also, uh, well, I don't think it's an active project, but uh, as in it's, it's not something that has started yet, but uh, there, are, there is talk of parallelizing bin utils as well, which is the, the linking process, because currently, uh, what you can do is, if you have a large project with 100 source files, uh, you can compile those in parallel, but when you're looking to link them, all of that kind of concentrates into this one link chop, and that is single-threaded. So we're trying to solve that problem. I think the LLVM linker is uh, multi-threaded at present. Uh, the gold linker is also multi-threaded, but it doesn't work very well because it's not maintained. So the, the regular linker now, uh, we're, we're trying to make it multi-threaded. Back to LLVM, like comparison, you know, how do you see the roadmap of GCC? Like LLVM is really taking up traction on Android. Um, how do you see, you know, this two exist side by side, or do you see your thoughts? So I would like to see them exist, exist side by side. How it is going to end up is anybody's guess at this point. Uh, because, again, uh, I don't want to comment on that because that becomes a political question, and I don't want to make that sort of statement on tape. <laughs> uh, at the, the beginning, uh, you mentioned the steps that to generate the binary. Uh, do you know if it's the same to generate the U-boot or kernel binary? Uh, fundamentally, yes. Uh, in the sense that you will you will have an assembly code generation, uh, then binary, and then a final object. Uh, the nature of the object differs, meaning that uh, what we generated over here was a dynamic binary, right? Uh, your kernel is essentially a static binary. So there's that difference. I think I have time for one last question. There's probably a talk after this, right? Or not. Okay. Thank you. Oh, that's good. <laughs>